Okay, thank you all for coming to this Monday afternoon seminar. Today it's a great pleasure to have with us Francesco Montanari from the IFT. He will tell us about dark matter constraints with Milky Way stellar dynamics. So Francesco, you have the floor, please. Okay, thank you. So the, this talk, it is based on these two papers. So it is uh, split into two parts. Um, in, they are both a collaboration with uh, Juan and uh, the first paper also in collaboration with uh, David Barrado, who is also from Madrid. Uh, in the first part of the talk, I will show uh, a method that uh, we use to uh, look for trajectories, for intersection of trajectories of stars and other objects like a global cluster or nearby galaxies. And in the second part of the talk, I will focus uh, on a particular object that are stellar streams as a proof uh, of dark matter. So both projects are aimed at constraining dark matter models. Okay, so one of the uh, most important data sets that uh, uh, we had available for these projects, it is the Gaia data set, which is a, a satellite from the European Space Agency. Uh, that has observed uh, uh, billions of stars in the Milky Way and uh, other objects. Uh, it observed positions and proper motion. So just to have an idea uh, about the precision that it can reach, uh, the, prede the predecessor of Gaia, it is uh, a satellite called Hipparchos that was named after the Greek astronomer uh, Hipparchus. So the Greek astronomer was one of the first to uh, outline a celestial map with the precision of one degree in the separation of the stars, which correspond to placing a human being 100 meters away. Uh, Hipparchos, the satellite, so the predecessor of Gaia from some 20 years ago or so, it could reach the precision uh, to resolve star separated by uh, the size of the human place on the moon. Instead, Gaia can resolve even the thumbnail of uh, that human place on the moon. Uh, so with the precision, of, that's the precision of uh, one micro arc second. And it also a very amazing precision of several stars of uh, one milli arc second per year for, for the velocities. So what we could do with this, uh, uh, with this uh, data, it is uh, to trace back the trajectory of a selection of stars, okay, also outside the Milky Way and uh, see if this trajectory intersects the uh, trajectories of other objects, namely global clusters and the dwarf galaxies. And uh, to do that, uh, so what we had available at the time was the Gaia data release 2. Now, since 10 days, there is the early data release 3 of Gaia. There are significant differences. So all the analysis that I'm going to talk about uh, will need to be redone again based on this catalog because there are important uh, differences for the selection of star that uh, we took. Uh, so the idea, uh, one of the motivation is that uh, in this uh, early catalog of Gaia, there were some star characterized by very high velocity uh, whose trajectory was pointing toward the galactic disk. And the origin of this star uh, is not known. So one interesting perspective, it is to explain the trajectory of this star based on the so-called gravitational slingshot effect. That is also useful to constrain uh, dark matter models. Uh, so here in the standard particle dark matter, uh, model uh, dark matter, it is uh, expected to fill uh, more or less uniformly space and the stars can move within it. Instead, if a cold dark matter it is composed uh, by primordial black holes, uh, this uniform distribution would be uh, replaced by a black hole in the center. And uh, what uh, can happen now, it is that if I have a star with a given uh, velocity, uh, due to gravitational recoil, uh, with the interaction with the black hole, it can be kicked out at a uh, very large velocity. And if this happens in objects that are characterized by a relatively uh, shallow potential well, like globular cluster of uh, dark galaxies, this velocity can exceed the escape velocity, and then it possibly can reach uh, our Milky Way. So this kind of effect could explain the trajectory of these very high velocity stars. 
and uh, it can also be useful to constrain uh, a given dark matter model. Uh, so to do that, uh, we need to recover the trajectory. Namely, we need the full uh, six uh, uh, dimensional phase space information, which means position and velocities. And uh, uh, for globular cluster and galaxies, we also need the information about the size, about uh, the radius. Um, so from the more than 1 billion uh, stars that we have in Gaia, we selected about uh, 2,000 hypervelocity stars that were selected based on several quality cuts uh, and also uh, by computing the probability of them to be unbound to the Milky Way potential. Um, and then we correlate these trajectories uh, with the trajectories of globular cluster. We have uh, about 50 globular cluster and the data always come from Gaia uh, DR2. And then in nearby galaxy, mainly dwarf galaxies, and the, here we combine data from uh, DES uh, and from Gaia DR2. So this is the velocity distribution, the galactocentric uh, total velocity distribution for the stars, uh, this curve at high velocity. So we see that uh, stars are characterized by uh, something around 10 to the three kilometer per second of velocity. So they are, these are very fast stars. Uh, because they, they are bound to the Milky Way potential. And, and uh, one can compare, for instance, with the velocity of global cluster of galaxies that are rather in the range of 100 kilometers per second. Uh, this is the selection uh, in space. So these are galactocentric coordinates. So the, here it's the center of the galaxy, the sun, it is this uh, black star that is slightly uh, displaced by eight kiloparsecs. Uh, so the red uh, crosses, the red error bars are the stars. Uh, so we see that we have a large error here and these are mainly due to error on the radial distances. So rad uh, errors on parallaxes. So Gaia is a very good precision, but these stars with the high velocity, they are rather uh, distant stars. So here, this case here is this 10, 20, even 30 kiloparsec for some star. So even Gaia here, it has difficulties at uh, getting a good precision on the distance. Um, and I will come back on that uh, later. And uh, here, the blue dots, they are the globular clusters. So here, it is a very asymmetric distribution. Here, for example, in this quadrant, we don't have uh, any global cluster. So we check that uh, this is just uh, what the guy observed. So this is not uh, an asymmetry that we introduce with our selection. It is a symmetry that is uh, present also in the full Gaia catalog. And uh, that's the same for galaxies. So here the black star is still again uh, our sun and we have uh, galaxies that are further away. The, the most distant uh, it is Andromeda. Uh, and then here we have a selection of uh, mainly dwarf galaxies. So here uh, I look at the globular clusters and galaxies at the heliocentric distance in kiloparsec compared to the size of the given object. Okay, so globular cluster are as expected uh, relatively smaller. Uh, uh, at most, uh, uh, let's say 100 parsecs. And here the largest object, it is Andromeda. The red line, it corresponds to the most distance uh, hypervelocity star that we have in our selection. And this object here, which is the largest one within this distance, it is the, Sag the Sagittarius dwarf, dwarf spheroidal. <clears throat> and uh, this is turns now to be the most uh, interesting uh, object for our search of the trajectory intersection. Okay, so now that we have uh, this information about position, uh, velocity, and the size of the uh, object, in this case, I show the Sagittarius dwarf spheroidal, uh, we can look for trajectory intersection. So we, uh, we can trace back the trajectories of the star. The marker showed the position of the object today. So these are star, two stars, and here it's uh, Sagittarius, the dwarf spheroidal. 
uh, what is evidence? So here I am sampling from the data probability distribution. Uh, so the uh, density of line, it is proportional to the likelihood. And what it is very clear it, is that it, there is a displacement over one direction. So in this galactocentric coordinate, the sun will be placed uh, more or less here where I have my mouse cursor. So this displacement correspond to the uh, radial direction from the sun and it is precisely the uncertainty on the distance that uh, I was uh, measuring before. So here the uncertainty on the parallax that we used to get the distance, they are uh, by far the most limiting factor for uh, our results. Um, <clears throat> and uh, here what uh, we define it is an impact parameter. So the small r, it is the separation of a star uh, with the object at the given time. We take the minimum separation over all time that uh, we trace back uh, relative to the size of a given object. This defines our impact parameter. So if theta it is less than one, it means that uh, we have a hit, there was intersection. Otherwise, it, if it is much larger than one, then the, there was no intersection. So the, that's the very basic idea. And uh, as said, we have uh, all the data to uh, that define the likelihood for the stars, for the globular cluster and the galaxies. Uh, for the star, the distance is determined by the parallax, the, the same for globular clusters. For the galaxies, we have the distance modulus and we sample uh, from proper motion, the mu here, and from radial velocities. Uh, and then from the galaxies, we also sample from the probability distribution of the size of the given object. So these are data that I mentioned before. With this information, uh, we can uh, um, correlate the trajectory of the stars and globular, and globular clusters and of the stars with galaxies. To build uh, the likelihood uh, for the impact parameter for each uh, pair of object that uh, we include in our selection. So this is the probability of the data D given uh, the model for the impact parameter theta. So that's the likelihood for theta. What we find is that uh, uh, all the cases of our interest are very well fit by SQ log normal, okay? Uh, which will allow us uh, to compute the, the evidence uh, analytically. So at this point, one can go on with the very standard Bayesian hypothesis testing. So we have a hypothesis H that there was intersection of the trajectories and the H bar, there was no intersection. So the, these are complementary uh, hypotheses. We compute the marginal likelihood given the likelihood of the impact parameter and the prior. For the prior, uh, we opt for a flat choice given a lower and the upper threshold of these impact parameters. And then we can compute the bias factor that gives us the strength of the evidence in favor of uh, our hypothesis that there was intersection. So <clears throat> here the prior, it is a very simple one. And uh, in principle, it should be refined for every object in our uh, catalog. But the idea here was to run a very wide search with the different object that runs from globular cluster to very elliptical galaxies. So what we wanted to have a uniform uh, treatment uh, of the prior here. And that's also partly why we introduced these, uh, uh, these thresholds. So we can play a bit uh, um, with the range of the prior at least. And uh, so what we find when we run this search, it is that there are two interesting uh, possible uh, hits of uh, these two stars with the Sagittarius dwarf uh, spheroidal. So this is the likelihood of the impact parameter. The shaded region are the um, one sigma uh, credible intervals. And uh, they are both compatible with the theta one. So they are both compatible uh, with the intersection hypothesis. Uh, we can also compute the bias factor. And uh, here we see that we reach a very strong bias factor. 
uh, for the two candidates. And uh, here, what I'm showing it is the bias factor as a function of the upper thresholds of the prior. Here, the idea is that, uh, uh, for instance, for globular cluster, the radius, it is defined as the proper motion radius. But uh, for galaxies, like for Sagittarius, it is defined as the half-light um, half radius. So it is not an excellent proxy of the dark matter distribution in that galaxy. And the dark matter distribution, it is precisely what uh, we are interested in, uh, what we expect uh, the, sc uh, the star to scatter with. So here we are uh, not, uh, we are less strict. We do not restrict to theta equal to one, but we enlarge the search up to 10. Uh, but we see that the peak of the bias evidence anyway peaks uh, around values one. And uh, this is the time of the intersection, which is minus around minus 20 and uh, minus 40 mega years ago. And uh, so we also uh, estimated the age of these stars and uh, we determined that they are at least 100 mega years uh, old. So they are perfectly compatible with this kind of intersection uh, time. And uh, also we checked that, uh, well, this time, uh, it is much more recent than the time when Sagittarius crossed the disk of the Milky Way. Because Sagittarius crossed the disk, so it could, could have been that this intersection were related to, to the cross of, this, uh, uh, of Sagittarius with the disk of the Milky Way. But this happened some 500 mega years ago. So these uh, are sorry, Francesco. Yes. Pierre has raised his hand. Can he ask a question? Oh, sorry, I, I don't see yeah, because you are in full screen. That's why I intervened. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, sure. It's okay. I didn't want to interrupt. I wanted to to you to to finish this thing. But uh, it's just um, it's a very basic question. I was wondering how, or maybe I just missed it. But how do you deal with the dynamics of of the stars? I mean, just the um, the trajectories, how do you determine them? Because somehow you have to trace things back in time. Yes. And I, maybe you told, you, you said that and I missed it. Yeah, yeah, so that's uh, that's what we do. So for instance, this is for stars. This is uh, the, uh, the likelihood for stars. So uh, what we sample from are uh, uncertainties uh, the, that involve distance measurement, rad uh, radial distance. Uh, well, there is also angular distance, but uh, the error budget, it is negligible. We have information about uh, proper motion, so angular velocities and about radio velocity. With this information uh, about positions and velocity, uh, we can also assume a given model for the Milky Way potential. So we assume a standard four component, uh, simple four component model for the Milky Way. So there is a nucleus, a bulge, a disk and a halo. We can evolve the trajectory of the star, uh, given this information within this potential of the Milky Way, and we can trace these trajectories back in time. And we can play the same uh, game with the global clusters because they are also orbiting the Milky Way, and with these galaxies because they are nearby galaxies, so they are also interacting with the Milky Way. And uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah. yeah. And more specifically, yeah, I didn't advertise it, but I should have, uh, we are using the software that is called the uh, Gala. Do you, do you account for the fact that the observations of the positions and velocities of the stars are made on the light cone and therefore that uh, you have a time, uh, you know, a time delay between uh, well, what you see and, what, and when they were there some, somehow? This is a very uh, stupid question. I'm sure you do, but or maybe well, it's the so these are uh, these these objects are all very close. We are talking about like a ten or ten to the three kiloparsec for Andromeda, but that's the exception. And the all the stars are within uh, thirty kiloparsec from us. So compared to their velocity, I mean, this the the time it takes for light to come to us is negligible. Uh, they wouldn't have moved. Basically, this is what you mean. Yeah, and uh, also where is the other one? So what we are interested in, it is the time of the uh, impact. So of course one could trace, okay. Um, yes, uh, that's a good point actually. So we trace back the trajectory of the star like uh, uh, 
uh, one giga years, okay? Uh, except for Andromeda, uh, we trace them back by five giga years, okay? So the, the Andromeda there is a, the exception, but uh, otherwise uh, um, we are we are have uh, quite a lot uh, of time where we trace back the trajectory after that there was intersection, uh, but this doesn't matter much because uh, the, the potential will change anywhere because we doesn't we don't take into account the scatter here the data of the scatter. So once we have the intersection and this happened like uh, 40 megahertz ago, then we are okay with it. So the scales are pretty small here. Thanks. Thanks. <clears throat> yeah. And uh, okay, so okay, so th these were the good results, uh, but uh, as I mentioned before, the limiting factor of these results are the distances and the uncertainties on the distances on the parallax. Here, these results are based on the catalog uh, from Marchetti, uh, this work here. But uh, it turned out that uh, the, this uh, parallax estimate uh, from Gaia DR2, they are affected by serious systematic errors uh, that have been uh, accounted for, for example, in this paper. And there are also other ways to account uh, for this uh, uh, for the systematic errors. If we use the distance estimate from this paper, we have no hits. Okay. So the, this depends a lot on the distance reconstruction given the parallax that uh, we opt for. I don't know what uh, would happen if we would use the last release uh, from Gaia, the ARC tree. So it would be interesting to run that. It would be centrally different from this distance catalog. I don't know if distances will be compatible with this one. Uh, yeah, but uh, let's say this prompts us to say that uh, Sagittarius, it is a possible uh, interesting uh, um, object. And uh, not only for that, but also for another reason, which brings me uh, to the second part of the talk. So Sagittarius, it is a dwarf spheroidal, a very elliptical one. Uh, that has been uh, tidally stripped while orbiting around the Milky Way. Okay, so it is a stream uh, like this one. Uh, these are called stellar streams, so they are filamentary st uh, structures where are, that are composed by stars that have been tidally stripped away. And uh, there are several of these streams. There are uh, a few dozen streams that are known from more recently from the uh, DES, for instance. And uh, recently, they have been uh, uh, an interesting object uh, to constrain dark matter properties. So this is on the top panel. There is the observation of uh, one of these stream. It is not Sagittarius. It is called uh, GD1. And uh, the reason why it is interesting for dark matter uh, constraint, it is the following. So even by high here, one can see that there are very clear features. For, for instance, here, there is a huge gap in stars. Here, there is another gap and the spur. So for instance, what they did in this uh, nice work was to assume that this stream was hit by a sub -halo, a dark matter subhalo object some 500 mega years ago when this stream was still folded upon itself. So there was this uh, subhalo that uh, hit the stellar stream like a bullet and left these two gaps here and the spur of stars. Based on that, one can uh, simulate the stream and the collision and recover, for instance, what was the most likely mass of this perturber or its size, the impact parameter, the velocity, and so on. And uh, information like uh, the mass of this subhalo object or the size, it is very useful to constrain a dark matter model. Uh, the limitation of the analysis is that, uh, in general, one does not expect just one perturbation, uh, one uh, one collision with dark matter object. One expects a dozen, if not hundreds of them along the lifetime of a stream like GD1. So this, this can be three to nine giga years old. So there were other papers that instead of focusing on these uh, very visible features, they computed uh, some summary statistics like the power spectrum 
of the density stream. But here, the density perturbation induced by this object, they are not expected to be Gaussian. So there will be still information in the bispectrum and in principle in the infinite series uh, of endpoint correlation function. So for instance, here I showed the density perturbation uh, induced by perturbers in uh, two different mass ranges, a very small mass range. So here I'm assuming dark matter cluster of 10 to the three to 10 to the five solar masses. And here a more standard 10 to the five, 10 to the nine solar masses. The dashed line, it is the smooth stream that has not interacted with the dark matter. And then uh, we see that uh, if we simulate impacts with dark matter object, the stream gets perturbed, a small perturbation for a small mass object, and that gets larger if we increase the mass range. And uh, so here, to reconstruct this, uh, this perturbation as a function of the angular separation from the progenitor, here it will be the progenitor of the stream, so the object that was tidally stripped away, we need to uh, sample from a few parameters, including the time of the impact, the angular position of the impact, the flyby velocity of the dark matter object, the mass, the size, the impact parameter, and the expected number of collision along the, the, the life of the stream. Okay, so instead of computing uh, the power spectrum on the bar spectrum that are, that are possibly incomplete uh, uh, statistics, uh, the, the idea that we had was to use the most simple statistic that we can, could uh, come up with, which is just to build a histogram of this density perturbation. So to build the probability density function uh, for this perturbation. Here, the blue one, it is for the small mass range and the orange one, the most wide one, it is for the large mass range. Here I have the density perturbation. So the density divided the density of the smooth stream. And uh, so what uh, one see, for instance, is that for the small mass range, the distribution, it is pretty close to Gaussian. And uh, sigma, it is more or less 0.1. That's because uh, that to correspond to this profile, short noise level here, it is 10%. So it is precisely the same level as the expected perturbation. So this case here, it is dominated by short noise. And that's what explains this very uh, symmetric behavior here. Instead for the last mass range, we can still see a non negligible asymmetry here. So we see more features. But uh, what matters to us is that the two curves, they are very distinguishable. So now we have uh, this curve. This curve, they are basically histograms for every bin. And uh, I call a number histogram with the Greek uh, index alpha. Here I choose 20 histogram. One can marginalize over this number eventually. And the idea is to take every bin of this histogram and to perform model selection based uh, on each bin. So for every bin, I say given an observed uh, PDF profile, what's the probability that it will be uh, compatible with the small mass range or the large mass range. So the reason why I choose these two mass ranges is that uh, the, this one, it is a very small mass range. And the, if it is the one that is preferred by data, then it is a very a strong hint in favor of the uh, primordial black hole dark matter hypothesis, because it is much more likely to form a sub uh, to form clusters uh, of these masses. Okay, but in principle, so this is a minimal example of the methodology. One can also have a more mass range to constrain more more finally uh, the mass spectrum. Okay. So now if I take every single bin here, I can plot the probability distribution for every single bin here, which is what I plot here. So in other words, I'm going to plot the PDF of the PDF of the density uh, to correspond to every bin, okay? So this is for bin five to bin 16 for the plot that I showed before. This central region, 
show that the true profile, the small one, which is the black line and the large mass, which is the red line, they are very distinguishable. And this central region, these central beans correspond to this bin here, where it is clear very separable. Then the two curve crosses here. And that's what we see in bin eight and bin 13. So we expect less evidence there. And then they become separate again because uh, I have zero frequency for the small mass range. That's because the Gaussian profile here, it dies already while the large mass range, it, has, it still has some shape. Okay, so given these profiles, the idea it is to use these profiles that are simulated as a prior information for my uh, model selection. So again, I'm going to perform a Bayesian model selection. I have two models, the small mass and the large mass that I named 0, 1. The PDF, the simulated PDF, they provide information about the prior distribution for a given model, which I can use uh, to integrate the likelihood to, to give, uh, that gives the evidence. Give it the evidence uh, as usual, I go on and compute the bias factor. So I did, of course, eventually one want to use data, determine the likelihood with data, but here we were happy just having forecast. So we, we perform the forecast assuming two different uh, fiducial model. So we compute the evidence, first assuming that the small mass range uh, is the truth, it is the fiducial model, and then we play the same game by assuming that the truth is given by the large mass range. So we will have uh, the estimate for two different bias factor that will give the strength of the of uh, one mod of one model compared to the other in the two in the two fiducial cases. So here it's again the same PDF plot as before. It is useful to understand what's going on here. On the right, I have the log of the evidence of the bias factor. Okay, so here there is a kind of complicated uh, shape. And uh, so to understand the shape, one can start from the central region where we have the uh, highest evidence for the two cases. This is the evidence when comparing the central beans here. So it's not surprising that we have, a, let's say, moderate to stronger evidence because here the profiles are very different. Then we have a minimum when they profile intersects. And then it rises again when uh, only the small mass range dies out. And then um, they both uh, give again small evidence. So here, uh, the, the central region, it is the most reliable one to estimate the evidence because here we have a resolution problem. So as I showed before, in this region in detail, I'm approximating the PDF of the small mass range basically with the one bin, which is uh, generally not a good approximation of a PDF distribution. Uh, that's because I have a very small values here. Uh, so one should think more uh, um, elaborated strategies like a mix uh, of uh, log binning with the linear binning and so on. But uh, for this work, we are happy to see this uh, uh, promising evidence, at least in this uh, central region here. Okay, <laughs> so that's one way to constrain these uh, density profiles. And uh, as a complementary method, uh, we also uh, perform this same classification. So considering the two small mass and large mass models, but using a gradient Pustig uh, algorithm. So this is the, say the artistic impression of uh, how gradient boosting uh, works. Uh, so gradient boosting algorithms are classifiers and uh, they work based on decision tree. So let's say that we have a sample uh, of data about uh, some person. We have information about age, gender, occupation. And uh, we want to understand, to predict whether a given person will like a hypothetical computer game X. 
So one way to uh, approach this problem uh, programmatically, it is to build a decision tree, which asks a question like, is the age of a given person less than 20 years old? Yes or no? And uh, based on the answer, I will attribute uh, a given score. So this score, it is attribute uh, given based on uh, some loss function that I can define as I want. Eventually, this will be normalized to be a probability. So this will say uh, this group, it is more likely than this one to like this computer game X. This is, of course, a very naive uh, classifier. So what one can do, it is to build an ensemble of this weak predictor to build a, a strong predictor. So instead of considering only this decision tree, I can build another decision tree, which asks another question, like uh, does the, uh, the person give, use the computers daily, yes or not? And again, I attribute one score. So here the important point is that those two trees, they are kind of uh, complementary between each other. And that's where the power of combining them uh, comes from. So one can define some metrics. Uh, it could be the average or just the maximum score and so on. Uh, the point is that the ensemble of these weak predictors will give a strong predictor to perform classification tasks. Uh, so that's what we can also do in our case. So instead of having information about the age, gender, and so on, we will have information about density perturbation in longitude bin one, longitude bin two, and so on. And for each one of these density profile in our uh, test data set, we will have a label attributed to them about whether they will uh, correspond, they were simulated based on model uh, zero, which is small mass, or uh, model one, which is large mass. Okay. So we can uh, fit this model and eventually we evaluate its performance based uh, on some simulation that we use just as a test set. So here uh, I show the results of the evaluation on the test set. So here, these are the predicted label from the gradient boosting model. And these are the true level that I know from the simulation. So diagonal elements are the elements in the test set that were correctly classified and the non-diagonal elements, they were not correctly classified. So the vast majority of them, they are either true negative or true positive, so correct classifications. And the one can define different metrics like precision, recall, accuracy. So all of them are excellently good. So this kind of problem, uh, it is very easy to approach with this uh, gradient boosting uh, algorithm. And um, so this was a single uh, label classification, uh, binary classification, binary because we only had two models, a single label because we assume that the given density profile can fall in uh, either of the model, but not two of them. So it is easy to extend this uh, kind of classification by allowing more mass ranges and by allowing a given density profile from being due to mass perturber in different uh, mass ranges, for instance. Um, and that's the an easy extension that we can do. Okay, so to add uh, toward the conclusions, for part one, um, I focus mainly on trajectory intersection between stars, Milky Way stars, and nearby galaxies or globular clusters. So these trajectories uh, are potentially a prove of the primordial black hole gravitational slingshot effect that is then useful to constrain a uh, dark matter model. Uh, the main limiting factor are the errors on the parallax. So one definitely needs to improve on the distance estimate for the hypervelocity stars. And uh, besides being a pro potentially pro dark matter models, it can also be used uh, as a very generic methodology for other aims. For example, one idea is to use this methodology as a guide to discover faint uh, dwarf galaxies. For instance, TES recently discovered uh, several dwarf galaxies. And in the future, one could trace back the trajectory of these uh, unbounded, unbounded hypervelocity stars uh, as a guide 
to, to discover even more of galaxies that are characterized by a small light to mass ratio. In the second part of this talk, instead I focus on one specific type of object, which are stellar stream, and uh, on their perturbation that are expected to be induced by dark matter perturbers, so subhalo object in the standard cold dark matter picture or primordial black hole uh, cold dark matter cluster. Uh, we have shown, uh, I have shown a very simple straightforward methodology based just on the PDF. So it doesn't assume that the density perturbation are Gaussian. Uh, it is not limited in that way. It is very straightforward analysis. It's just uh, computing histograms and uh, it, it, we expect moderate to strong evidence based on that. Uh, um, we are also exploring an alternative complementary methodology based on a gradient boosting uh, predictor, a classifier, and uh, which has very high uh, accuracy. We have not applied this methodology to data yet. That's definitely a next step that we want to do. Uh, there are already data available for the stream that I mentioned, the GD1. Uh, so this can be readily done. And uh, another step, it is also to constrain other property uh, of dark matter than mass. For instance, uh, the size of the perturber. So the joint information about the size of the mass, it will be uh, really important uh, to distinguish between uh, dark matter models, for instance. And, uh, but something that uh, we already see in, and expect from this uh, forecast is that uh, Stellar stream are very promising to probe the mass range below 10 to the 5 solar masses. Uh, an alternative methodology to that would be lensing, for instance. But uh, uh, today, there is no lensing of observation that can be so accurate to probe this mass region. So these are uh, quite new object uh, to study in the context of dark matter constraining. Uh, there are papers mainly in the last couple of years. Uh, well, maybe two, four years that does that. So this, this is a very promising uh, uh, way of placing constraint on dark matter. Okay, so as a very last conclusion, since I will be around only until the end of the year, I also want to take the opportunity to thank you, uh, not only to listening to this talk, but also for having hosted me at IFT in the last couple of years. It's been a great experience for me. Very happy that I've been around. Well, thank you, Francesco, and thank you for being with us for uh, these two years. And thank you very much also for the talk. Okay. Thank you very <laughs> thank much. You. Thank you, Francesco. I, I would say also it, it has been a pleasure to have you around. <laughs> thank exactly. you. Okay, so we have ample time for questions. So any questions, comments from the audience? Yes, Miguel, please. Uh, yes, can, can you hear me and see me? Yes. yes. Okay, very good. Yeah, so thank you, Francesco, for the nice talk. I really enjoyed the, especially the last part that I, I'm probably more familiar with. So I have a question regarding this the dark matter mass, uh, the, the dark matter perturber that you are using. Uh, you, you refer to two different regimes, mass regimes, below and above 10 to the 5. I guess that the imprint of this dark matter perturber in the stellar stream will also depend uh, importantly on the on the how you model the internal structure of the perturber. So can you can you explain how do you do that and, and in particular if there are differences between your modeling for below and above 10 to the 5? Yeah, yeah. So the, this is actually a very critical uh, point. So for, for what concerned the uh, model, internal modeling, we are assuming in both cases a Plummer sphere or Hanquin sphere, I think, but uh, they are more or less uh, comparable, let's say. It is true that uh, for the small mass range, so if, if cold dark matter, it is primarily black hole, we do not expect exactly a plumber sphere. The most inner region will differ from that. But uh, we are talking about uh, uh, scales that are not relevant uh, here. So we are only talking at, about the very center region of these perturbers and the size of this perturber is uh, typically on the range of uh, 10 parsec or so. Uh, so we do not expect this uh, kind of difference to make uh, um, 
uh, to be really relevant here. But uh, something else that we are doing is that uh, this region, it is completely unexplored in uh, embody codes. Uh, uh, so we are expo expo extrapolating results that are based on this mass range down to this mass range. Okay, so result uh, about the mass distribution, uh, about the number of impacts uh, uh, per year and so on, they are extrapolated, but we have not checked against a numerical simulation because the, this will require a very high accuracy in numerical simulation. The good point is that uh, here we are totally dominated by short noise. Okay, so the main power of this model is that we are just saying that perturbations are small enough to be below shot noise so we are not bound to the very precise shape of this perturbation so uh, in this respect we are kind of shaped because we are completely dominated by shot noise when compared to the large mass range but it is true that uh, eventually it would be nice to have some embody code that can cover this range so that we can be more confident on the perturbation okay i see so that's also the motivation to 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 choose this particular frontier this 10 to the 5 solar masses between the two models uh, so this very particular uh, threshold no there is not a particular region uh, let's say 10 to the 5 is kind of the most small mass range that uh, standard analysis do okay mm -hmm. uh, so we wanted to look even the smaller mass uh, than that and smaller mass than that they are not look not only because uh, embodied code cannot uh, resolve this the region below that but also because we do, uh, one does not expect many sub halo object in the standard cold dark matter picture uh, that to favor that's why the primordial cold picture will be favored if data hints at uh, this uh, small mass range well, in, in principle, in Lambda CDM, you, you have a two mass function that goes all the way down to, to very small masses, right? So I, do, I don't see why you shouldn't expect two of those masses in, in Lambda CDM. Yeah, in principle, it goes down, I think, to 10 to the minus two solar mass or so. Uh, but I think the point here is that it is much uh, more likely to form a, a halo, um, to form object of this size. Uh, so in the primordial black hole, um, from the call picture that would be just more likely not impossible uh, for and also the vice versa if we constrain this region this will not rule out this model but maybe Juan uh, if you want to have more comments please go on no it's actually you've answered uh, what I would have said now I would like to add also that there's a possibility of a splitting this question about the threshold where where to place the, the line now which I think it's a very pertinent one. So in fact, we could distinguish in this broad range from 10 to the five to 10 to the nine, another break up into two, right? And this is uh, something that we've already uh, initiated. So 10 to the five, 10 to the seven, and 10 to the seven, 10 to the nine, yes. it's, a, it's also a possibility because there are already differences between 10 to the seven and 10 to the nine, no? Yeah. Yeah. The first from the second one. So this is where you could have placed another uh, separating uh, barrier and, and see for the difference there. Um, while the difference between the low, so 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 9, is very clear cut, in the other one is not so much, there's not so much evidence. Now, that's for the moment. No? Uh, eventually, uh, since those are not uh, short mass dominated and you have, you, you can do uh, numerical simulations with embody, it's much uh, easier probably to, to understand how, how the perturbance uh, modify the, the density contrast along the stream. And therefore, you can uh, infer much better the, the distributions, which at the moment have larger error bars. So I would say in the future, with these methods, which are new, uh, one can explore uh, multiple bands in mass. Okay, Not only the low versus high, no, but uh, intermediate ones. And, and start to see issues which go beyond this work that have to do, for instance, with warm dark matter. Are there halos in our, around our galaxy which uh, happen to have a cutoff at 10 to the 7 solar masses or, or not? And this is the kind of questions which uh, at the moment uh, we, we cannot uh, address, but the, it's, it's in the list of things that we can do. So the, the, the statistical um, uh, proposals or, or um, analysis that we have uh, proposed are, are really open to exploration much beyond and it's something which uh, will be done eventually. Yes, thank you. 
Oh, yes, so precisely. So the point here, more than the split of the mass, it is the proposal of using the PDF as a very straightforward method that doesn't approximate uh, perturbation as linear, and it takes into account the full non-Gaussian uh, uh, profile of this perturbation. Mm -hmm. Okay, any more questions, comments? Thank you. Well, I, I have a, a well, more question than a comment. So have you had a look, uh, Francesco, on the data release three from Gaia to see whether there are uh, multiple hypervelocity stars in, in the new catalog? And uh, you can no, search for, for events? I haven't uh, had the time. So I only looked at these uh, stars. And we also have a few more stars that are uh, that are interesting. I didn't show them here, but uh, for this star that are interesting, uh, I checked for, I compared the parallax estimate and they differ even by a factor of 10 to oh, compared to what right. we had. Yes. And uh, so certainly the distance estimate will differ from Marchetti because Marchetti didn't, didn't take into account uh, uh, any parallax offset. Uh, this guy here, they, they took into account some parallax offset, but uh, again, I didn't compare the data to know. Uh, I didn't check if there is already a distance catalog related to the early release of the data release tree. So I don't know how distance you will compare here. Yeah. And I, I don't know how much hypervelocity stars we will have. That's also, yes, another good point. We will have more hypervelocity stars. Right. I would expect many, many more in the data release tree because of the volume covered. Yeah, um, so there will be more, but still, I'm not sure if uh, Gaia DR3 is still a powerful, no, because we are talking about uh, start like a 30 kiloparsec. Okay, let's say, yeah, at least more than one kiloparsec away. So they are very distant object. It's very hard. True. But uh, let's hope. <laughs> yeah, the next releases will be uh, even larger. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay, any more questions, comments? Okay, if there are no more comments, then we can thank uh, Francesco again for this very nice talk and uh, see you all on Wednesday for the Christmas workshop. Thank you again, Francesco. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Francesco. Very nice. Thank you. Yes. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Bye -bye. See you. Bye. Bye. Bye.